We'd like to acknowledge that we are producing this podcast on Treaty 8 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, as well as the Métis. We honor and acknowledge all of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples who have lived, traveled, and gathered on these lands for thousands of years. We recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. The following is based on a true story that happened in Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada, in 1918. The story is based on historical primary sources, including surviving case files, criminal reports, and other contemporary documents and accounts. The first-person accounts spoken throughout this narrative are taken word for word from the surviving transcripts. We have engaged voice actors to read portions of these transcripts, and while these quotes have been at times abridged or slightly rearranged for clarity, Every word is based on the historical record. In this episode, we'll be taking a small step back from the forensics, suspects, and twists and turns of the six murder case in order to better understand the wider context of settler life in northern Alberta in 1918. We'll learn about the 1909-1910 Peace River Country Settlement Boom which saw thousands of settlers making a grueling multi-month overland journey into the north before the eventual establishment of a northern railway to the region in 1916. We'll also explore some of the social and cultural realities of life on what would be called North America's last great frontier. If you want to understand the case, you'll need to understand the historical context. If you're just joining the podcast, we'd encourage you to stop this episode and go back to episode one to learn the basic facts of the six murder case. If you've already listened to a few episodes, then this might be a good time to dig deeper into the local history, so stick around. I'm Chris Sapola. I'm Chris Beauchamp. This is Blood on the Prairie. from local homesteader William Stanley Bird in episode 3, where we shared an excerpt of a letter that Bird wrote to his father in June of 1918, about a month after the murders. In that excerpt, Bird proved to be a slightly unreliable narrator, colorfully embellishing details of the case. Two cowboys from Montana came up here last week and murdered seven men, six Germans and a Russian. Some of the victims were drowned and some burned. One had his head cut off and some were shot. They were all killed two at a time except for the seventh. We found that letter thanks to some help from the South Peace Regional Archives. And the archives actually contains a couple of other letters from Bird, one of which was addressed to someone named Peg. Whether Peg was a friend, a love interest, or maybe a family member is not entirely clear. But Bird paints a vivid picture of life in the region both in his own words and in the lyrics of a song sung locally. We've excerpted that letter and those lyrics here, accompanied by some music. Dear Peg, howdy. I hope highly honorable Mel didn't buck your contemptible self off yet. I told Orford to fetch her up here, but if you want her, you can keep her. I've got woodpeckers and a robin's egg. I'll send them down if you want them. I can get a martin's, swallows and canary's eggs if you like. All houses here are built of logs and fences of poles. Everybody seems to be a cowboy here. The other day I saw a man on horseback, saddle, chaps, spurs, and all riding behind the harrows. About that song, Prairie Land, here it is. We've reached the land of frozen wheat where nothing grows for man to eat, where winds do blow with mighty heat, across the prairies, hard to beat. O prairie land, 
sweet prairie land, as on the burning grass we stand, and look across the burning plain, and wonder why it never rains. We have no wheat, we have no oats, we have no corn to feed our goats. Our hens they are, too poor to lay, go scratching dust along the way. The bachelor lives there, all alone. Poor George, in the little sod shack he calls home. He darns his socks and bakes his bread, and often wishes he was dead. We trudge along behind the plow with flying ants and mosquitoes now. We sought our shacks and try to rest and curse the day we came out west. It's unclear if these lyrics were original to Bird or if he was sharing from local folk songs. He concluded his letter with a short update. I got a coat and a pair of gauntlet gloves just covered with beads and fringes. My saddle is sure a peach. I bought a 38 revolver from Charlie Wilson and it fitted the little holster fine. I had a real walnut handle. It was a dandy. Somebody stole it in Edmonton. Well, that's about all, so I'll close. From Cowboy Bill. It's worth noting that Bird's stolen gun almost certainly had nothing to do with the murders. But it is indicative of the petty crime which could be rampant among settlements and travelers at the time. We don't know how William Stanley Bird came to the peace region, but we do know that he filed his claim on May 6, 1918. He had only been in the region for a couple of months when he wrote these letters. His homestead was near La Glace, Alberta, about 50 kilometers or 31 miles from Grand Prairie. As historian David Leonard explained to us, Bird's rather dire image of rugged life in the peace region wasn't far off the mark. Life was difficult, and even though there were already a number of small settlements in the area by 1918, most people lived on individual homesteads, oftentimes isolated from neighbors and nearby communities. Grand Prairie became a village in April 1914, the first incorporated community in the Peace River country. And in 1919, it was elevated to the status of a town with over 500 people. The railway having come in from the north in 1916 saw the development of of the subdivided communities of Sexsmith and Claremont at that time. And Claremont especially developed right in 1916-17, and uh, it was incorporated as a village in 1917. And then at the time, because so much development was occurring on the Grand Prairie, you had larger hamlets growing up very rapidly in, uh, well, Lake Saskatoon was always there, but in Beaver Lodge, in Hythe, and in Sexsmith, and uh, then smaller post offices were established in dozens of little communities, uh, be it uh, Halcourt, be it Dalhalla, be it La Glass, just a store and a post office, and uh, that's where people would communicate with uh, each other and uh, get their mail, and then deal with uh, more extensive business, be it shopping, be it, uh, well, lumbering, and be it services like hospitals in the larger community of Grand Prairie, if that was needed. But still, most people lived far out in the remote areas, developing their farms, so life was extremely difficult on the farms. I mean, gosh, if you get an abscess tooth, what do you do? There are no dentists up here. We well, just had to live with it and eventually maybe pull the thing out with your pliers or get somebody to do it for you. You break a leg and you're out there on your own developing a farm. What do you do? People get caught in thunderstorms. They get caught in prairie fires that often occurred on the prairie. The sheer loneliness of life on the prairie when you're developing a farm on your own, which is what most of them were doing, was uh, quite a challenge at the time. And yet, despite the challenges, Settlers found beauty and contentment living off the land, too. Bird's description of his homesteading life is indicative of the experience of many of the people in the region at the time, most of whom were single men. As Bird wrote in that letter to his dad, 
right after describing the recent murders, there was a lot of natural abundance in the region. I've got a nice homestead with a creek running through it. Lots of beavers in it. Plenty of moose and bears by the tracks, though I never saw any yet. Haven't time to hunt any. I'm about 40 miles from Grand Prairie, called Prairie City here. I'm four miles from a post office and three miles from a store. There's wild horses here too. Silver and cross foxes are thick. A timber wolf is seen once in a while. Poplars grow here three feet at the bottom, spruce too. It makes good lumber logs for log houses and poles for fences. It is good firewood too. No worry about coal here. Not many fish here. Wheat is not grown much here. Bows and oats are more favorable. Timothy hay is as good as anything. It is shipped to lumber camps in BC. There is a path here said to be the trail where the Klondikers went. It was a pack trail afterwards from Prairie City to Pooscoopy. It only shows in a few places now and where the land is not plowed. Well, there's lots more, but I'll write again. Must close. Love from Stan. Bird was one of many single men living on the Grand Prairie. As historian and former executive director of the South Peace Regional Archives, Alyssa Curry reminded us, homesteaders faced an often lonely and isolated existence. So Grand Prairie has what, what we now know to be exceptional agricultural capacity and um, rich rivers and timbers and all of these fantastic resources that lend themselves so well to settlement. At that time in Canada, there's not a lot of other places left. This is the largest untapped portion of land left in the West for settlement and for agricultural settlement especially. Dominion Land Survey was begun by Walter McFarlane in what was described as the largest survey crew to ever set out to survey a portion of Western Canada. He had over 20 men in his uh, survey because he was assigned to do outlines for 37 different townships throughout the Peace River country, but mostly in the Grand Prairie where there was 18 townships and then on the Grand Prairie required to subdivide the quarter sections within that. And um, he uh, left Edmonton amid much fanfare, big headline stories in the Herald Tribune, the, the last great West as this area was known as. And it's called the last great West in recognition that the last best West was Western Canada in general, because that is uh, the subject of a brochure they published with the Canadian Pacific Railway. Well, the Peace River Country is going to do them one better. And so the last great West was how this land was described. And he went up there and undertook his surveys in the summer of 1909 and 1910. And in the meantime, the Dominion government established a... Uh, Dominion Land Office at Gruard, which was the biggest community north of Athabasca at that time. And um, Peter Tompkins was land agent. And a land rush really started to begin in 1909 in the spring, right when Walter McFarland was up there uh, surveying. The idea was that people could get homes next to each other. So much land being surveyed all at once. So you have this mad rush of settlers followed by, in very rapid kind of order, the establishment of the first bank, the first hotel. Um, there's a movie theater in Grand Prairie at this time, surprisingly. It's a rough life for the people that have come here. Uh, the railway has been established uh, fairly recently, but most people who have settled in Grand Prairie by this time likely came through on the Edson Trail. So they've made a very long journey uh, with a wagon and a horse and hauling their, their belongings. And most people at this time are settled on either a homestead or they're squatting on a piece of um, unsurveyed land. Uh, I should say most um, non-Indigenous people at that time have settled on these tracts of land. Now, 
in order to kind of put up your claim for homestead, there are certain obligations that you have to follow from the government. So your first year, you have to clear a certain amount of land. By your second year, you had to have built some kind of lodging. And so this was hard manual labor for many people. And although we are very fortunate this time to have the amount of resources, a hotel and a a store and all of these things, um, schools, there's several schools established at this time. It is still um, very much an unsettled, if you want to refer to it that way, land. Uh, most people are consumed primarily with the quarter acre that they are focused on clearing or on their immediate neighbors, many of whom probably would have been uh, family members. If family members came, they quite often selected adjoining plots. So it's it's rough. Um, it has some conveniences. And I think it's important to note, Grand Prairie isn't empty at this time. Like it's it's the Grand Prairie is occupied by close to a thousand people, I believe at this point. You have in 1921, you have the census come through and they find at that point, I think about 2,000 people living on the prairie and 1,000 people living in and around the town. So there's certainly lots of people here. As we already know, the, the indigenous settlement at Flying Shot Lake and other places were already well established at this time. But most people are looking inward to their immediate needs and their immediate physical vicinity. They're looking at their homestead and the things that they need to do in order to make life better for themselves at this point. Despite Grand Prairie being the largest community in the area, the railroad didn't actually come into town. And travelers would have to make the connection from the station in Sexsmith to Grand Prairie by horse-drawn transport or one of the few hired cars. Before the rail line to Sexsmith was established, Settlers to the region would come in over one of a couple of difficult overland routes. Before 1911, most European settlers came from Edmonton on what was known as the Athabasca Trail through Gruard to the northeast. The Edson Trail was opened in 1911 and offered a shorter route more directly from the south. But getting to Grand Prairie over either trail could take several weeks or months through harsh weather, dense forested foothills, muskeg swamp, and large and small river crossings. The journey was dangerous, and there were reports of crimes on the trail. Despite these challenges, settlers began a proper rush of settlement to the Peace River country in 1909. By 1908, there was so much production of wheat throughout Western Canada and the United States too, that the prices began to drop. And all over the West, people were looking to establish bigger farms. Farmers were selling out to equally cramped neighbors and trying to go somewhere where they could get larger holdings. Well, the Peace River country was ideal for that because there's so much land thrown open for settlement at once. And so uh, you'll have people like Bernhard Foster in the Sexsmith area. He could get two quarters sections land, and his wife got two scripts. So that's eight quarters plus a homestead. Uh, Robert Cochran from just east of uh, Claremont, he also got that. David Sexsmith from the Sexsmith area did that as well. And Harry Adair, who established a ranch on the north end of Bear Lake, got 11 quarter sections because uh, a friend also took a uh, couple of scripts with them and they could establish a ranch at that time. What Dr. Leonard is referring to here is something called South African script. Basically, returning soldiers from the Boer War in South Africa were granted transferable land deeds called script. These deeds granted the bearer 320 acres and since they were easily sold or traded, they would allow some homesteaders, families, or settler outfits to claim larger and larger plots of land, far in excess of the single quarter section most individual homesteaders were allowed to claim. So a lot of these people started coming up in 1909. The land office at Gruard was open at the time, but he couldn't officially declare the, the entitlement and the uh, official assignment of homesteads until the 27th of May, 1910. Now this uh, resulted in a lot of confusion for a lot of people because they wanted to come up here, but 
if they came up here and squatted on the land before the survey, it's nice area here. We got a farm here, and we got a farmhouse here. And but they never knew where the uh, survey line was going to go. The survey line could go right through his yard, and you could have that quarter or that quarter, but not not the two of them. But other people would come up, and they'd like a pair a piece of land. They like this piece, that piece, but take this piece. But they go back to the land house in Gruard and find that somebody else has taken it. Or else you could go to Gruard and look at the maps and calculate which quarter you wanted, but come up here and find it was full of muskeg and bog and that was not too good afterwards. And most people at this time were coming up through Athabasca Land and Gruard and the long trail it was called all the way down to the Grand Prairie. Well, the Canadian Northern and the Grand Trunk Pacific, as I mentioned, had already started building west towards Jasper. And at the rail site of Edson, it was calculated that, gee, you know, it's just less than 100 miles get from here up to the Grand Prairie. And so that's when petitions began to develop for a trail. The railway wasn't there yet, and it wasn't going to come for a while, but they built the Edson Trail, which was opened in April 1911. And the following July, a land office was established at Grand Prairie. So this continued the rush of settlers into the Peace River country. At the end of 1914, no less than 2,675 applications for land had been made on the Grand Prairie. 1,854 would prove up their homestead for a success rate of 69.3%, whereas it's about 50% on the rest of Canada. 617 applicants were married, and that meant that 73% percent of the land applicants were not married. They were bachelors. And it was kind of surprising to people that there were that many bachelors around. It's a lonely experience, and bringing a family up is a pretty onerous situation, however. But in the early years on the prairie, the most common farm was owned by the single lone bachelor. And I know in later years, you'd see these guys that'd come to town and smell the high heaven and very eccentric because they're living alone. And uh, people who live alone most their lives develop little eccentricities, you know, but that was the standard of life on the prairie at the time was the lone bachelor. Now you read the local histories and what are they written by? They're written by those farmers who established homes, established families, and then their offspring and their offspring would write about that family experience. But those lone bachelors, they often just disappear into nothing because nobody can remember them anymore. And so their stories are seldom told in the local histories. We cannot help but think of our six victims. Five of the six were themselves bachelors. Agnes Patton, John Wuwand, Charles Zimner, Joseph Snyder, and his nephew Stanley Snyder. Frank Parzakowski, the blacksmith acquaintance of Agnes Patton, found shot to death in the Patton storehouse, was the only married man among the victims, although his wife was away at the time of the murders. And while these six men have indeed found a place in the history books, we know virtually nothing about them and their experiences as individuals. Thankfully, letters like William Stanley Bird's can give us a hint into the personalities and experience of the bachelors building a life on the Grand Prairie. Of the settlers who applied for a homestead in the area before 1940, the vast majority were English-speaking people of European descent, either with direct family roots in Canada or the United States. Of those settlers, 2,255 were born in Canada, 597 were born in the United States or later lived there. In other words, if somebody was born in Norway, moved to Minnesota, and uh, then went up the Peace River country, what is he, Norwegian or uh, American? Well, I call them both. So 
uh, it's been pointed out to me that this is the the numbers don't add up because too too high a percentage. But this is how I calculated it. So calculating that, thirty eight point five percent of the settlers on the Grand Prairie were American. 255 were born in England, 106 in Scotland, 49 in Ireland, 12 in Wales, 4 in the Isle of Man, meaning that the British-born were 17.6, not very high. And yet, of course, most of the Canadians who came up here to Homestead were of British stock, and a number of Americans were that way as well. Of the non-British population, 136 were born in Norway, most of them settling around the, the glass Valhalla area, 57 in Sweden, 7 in Denmark, 6 in Finland, 3 in Iceland. 55 were born in Austria, and 53 born in Russia. They did not distinguish them as Ukrainians because the Ukrainian was not an independent country. They were either in the Russian Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And most of the Ukrainians at that time settled around the Sexsmith district. 52 were born in Germany, 21 were born in Holland or Belgium, and 11 born in France. So that's at the end of 1914. With such a diverse mix of immigrants, it's no wonder that ethnic tensions among settlers would grow against the backdrop of the First World War. These tensions would spill over into the community and often fostered what we would today call bigotry, discrimination, and even racism. Well, the end of 1914 brought the advent of World War I. A little skirmish in uh, Europe, and by the beginning of 1915, they realized it was going to be more than a skirmish. So the appeal went out throughout the empire to uh, join the colors, and every homesteader on the Peace River country could put a curtailment to his development so that he could return to it after the war. And then he could use the capital that he built up by his war service, the payment for that, towards developing his farm when he got back. And um, the um, homesteaders also did other things during the winter months. A lot of them went trapping and uh, a lot of them uh, worked on the railways. A lot of them worked on the mines. They went out to work on the mines in the wintertime and to build up capital so that they could further develop the farm in the summertime. Most people, as I mentioned, that are in Grand Prairie at this time have come from Britain. And Canada is very much still part of the empire, the British Empire. Much of the, the narratives that people would have found themselves surrounded by are about not Canada, but the empire. And although Canada in this context was a place of opportunity, much the same as the States, um, people felt that it was a, a place for a new start. It wasn't a separate place necessarily in terms of economic and political influence. So you find at that time, the notion of king and country still really resonates with people because they would not probably have considered themselves Canadians in the same way that we do now. The sense of national identity doesn't come up until later. Um, it's certainly bolstered by the First World War, but leading up to the First World War, that sense of Canadian identity, of national identity, is really not there in the same way that it is now. As the war continued, uh, a lot of animosity began to build up against Eastern Europeans, be they Germans, Poles, Ukrainians, whatever. They often didn't distinguish. And the people who joined the colors to fight for king and country tended to be people of British stock. So a lot of animosity was developed at this time. Uh, nativism is the term that was used for it. 
And the Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1914 in Grand Prairie, a branch of it. And the vice principal of the local chapter was none other than John B. Taft, who was the mayor of Grand Prairie. And um, there were also slurs against uh, Orientals who were starting to come in to operate restaurants and to undertake laundry business. So there's a full flood of what you'd call, I guess, what people call nativism. And yet settlement continued to occur during the war. And between March 1915 and March 1918, there were 3,483 new applicants uh, for the, on the Grand Prairie. <clears throat> The railway that was uh, given to uh, John Duncan MacArthur and began to develop in 1912 didn't reach Grand Prairie until April 1916. But of course, that made a world of difference for people coming up here to settle because that Edson Trail was awful, as was the old Girard Trail. Just imagine all the uh, equipment and supplies people had to bring up with them if you're going to establish a farm. And those crude wagon roads, many people actually came up here in wintertime because the snow on the ground provided for greater mobility if you're coming in on sleds. But come they did, and then with the railway coming in 1916, of course the Edson Trail went into gradual decline, and uh, other people began to settle on this prairie. Now the Soldiers Settlement Board, which was established a lot of part of the war, provided for many war veterans to take land up in the Peace River country. Uh, land around Manning, for example, was opened up at this time around Teepee Creek and Bad Heart, mostly war veterans. War veterans could be very bitter people. They weren't, they were used to seeing killing, they were used to seeing talking about uh, and experiencing maiming, and, uh, and they too were very, very opposed to the Eastern Europeans who had allowed to come over and take farms at this time. The law was that if you were a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire or Germany, you were not allowed to own land, therefore you not gain title. But still, a lot of these people did develop their homesteads. Ethnic tensions likely increased sectarianism among the outlying communities. Groups which shared cultural, ethnic, or religious heritage were likely to mostly interact with each other. I think there was a lot of interaction between these people. They, they all get along. They may not have been great personal friends. I think when it came to personal friendship, the ethnic groups tended to stick within themselves. And yet they, had, they did business with each other. And uh, they, uh, um, I don't think there was great animosity at all until the war came and uh, then when it was realized that so many people of British stock were going out and dying in great numbers and you'd notice that not too many of these Eastern Europeans were joining the uh, color to fight for king and country. A few of them did but not that many did and so I think there was probably a very very strong animosity towards the the ones who stayed here and especially if they took farms that earlier British settlers had given up to go and fight and if they never came back the farm was open and so I think that developed during the course of the war. Uh, so uh, uh, by 1918 I think it was probably quite strong. By design, we have been exploring our story to date from a perspective rooted in the European settler point of view. But of course, it's impossible to understand North American colonization without exploring the perspectives and lived experience of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples who have resided on these lands for thousands of years. We will get a chance to listen to Indigenous perspectives in future episodes, and we look forward to recontextualizing the settler narrative through that lens. There's also a sense of emotional and cultural division between these particular victims and uh, a lot of the wider community. So, as you may know, uh, the Grand Prairie region was originally settled, if you want to use that term, by Deneza people who were here long before the land was opened up for 
settlement, formal settlement. Uh, we see a land rush about 10 years before uh, this murder takes place. And we have a lot of people coming from all over Europe, um, some from the States to come and claim their homestead and make themselves home. These victims are from Eastern Europe. And particularly around the time of the First World War, there seems to be a little bit of I don't want to say conflict, but a, a little bit of tension between those settlers and the predominantly British Western European settlers, uh, particularly when many of these community members are seeing the, the British or Western European settlers step up and volunteer to, to serve in the war um, for a variety of reasons. Um, it, it seems as if or it appears as if the, the Eastern Europeans were less likely. Um, whether or not that actually pans out in the numbers, we don't know. But there certainly seems to be a, um, a perception of that. And so as these community members are seeing their sons and their husbands go off to war, and in many cases hearing stories of the impacts of the war, there's a growing tension between them and who they see as a sort of other, those, those immigrants, they use the term often immigrants to refer to these Eastern European immigrants, uh, in spite of the fact that they themselves are also immigrants, um, simply from a different place. Even though the settlement boom had started in earnest almost a decade before the 1918 murders, many aspects of frontier life were still catching up to more settled regions in Western Canada. Nowhere was this more evident than in the challenge of policing this large and remote region. Valuable insights into these challenges can be found in the pages of the Alberta Provincial Police's own annual reports. The 1918 annual report contains a sub-report from Albert Edward McDonnell, Inspector Commanding of E-Division. E-Division represented the Greater Peace Region, including Grand Prairie. And according to the report, E-Division's territory covered approximately 140,000 square miles or 362,000 square kilometers. E-Division's force in 1918 included 20 people, 19 police constables and officers, and one stenographer. Crunching the numbers, that means that each individual was responsible for covering approximately 18,000 square kilometers. Of course, in reality, the force was concentrated in a few population centers, leaving much of the area effectively lawless. E-Division's headquarters was in the town of Peace River, almost 200 kilometers to the north of Grand Prairie. The Peace River detachment accounted for seven of E-Division's personnel. Grand Prairie had five, Gruard had two. The rest were scattered throughout smaller communities. Writing to his superiors in Edmonton, McDonnell was candid in his own assessment of the region's economic potential, as well as some of the challenges of policing such a large and wild area. The largest proportion of the country is unsettled, and that which is settled is practically given over to small farmers and homesteaders, there being very few farms of any size in the district. The prospect for immigration for the ensuing year is very bright, owing to the fact that the Soldiers' Settlement Board have been granted large area for the settlement of returned soldiers. Presciently, MacDonald outlined the major industries that would come to dominate this economically successful region for the next century. The oil situation at present time is not very prospective. Nevertheless, should oil be obtained in this vicinity in commercial quantities, it would materially facilitate the settlement of the country. In fact, will be the starting of an unprecedented boom. McDonald also laid out the promising prospects of forestry, livestock, and grain growing. Energy, forestry, and agriculture are the dominant natural resource industries in the region to this day. Life on the prairie 
at this time was pretty chaotic. And I'm referring to the year 1918 in particular, when there were a lot of returned veterans. One of them was the infamous Nobby Clark, who was in court five times over three years in Grand Prairie for pointing a gun at people and uh, assault and uh, other activities. And there was a lot of other criminality in the area at the time. So it was a fairly open society and sort of a crude society, a lot of coming, a lot of going, um, but approaching even the end of the war, uh, saw the establishment of uh, the Alberta Provincial Police. The recently formed Alberta Provincial Police had taken over policing in Alberta from the Royal Northwest Mounted Police a year earlier in May of 1917. And with their focus on bootlegging, the force was understaffed and ill-prepared to deal with the large variety of criminal behavior occurring across the Grand Prairie, not to mention a complex mass murder. Historically, we know that in Alberta and throughout most of Canada, that the police force is introduced when it benefits settlement and colonization. So you see introduced in particularly northern Alberta, the police force grows as they see a greater benefit for settlers, um, whether that be through homesteading or through the Klondike. From that benefit arises potential conflict with the indigenous peoples who have been living here. And so you see throughout uh, Alberta, the police often kind of following or just preceding settlement uh, and the arrival of settlers. Meanwhile, the province of Alberta feels that they are being slighted by the the Northwest Mounted Police, they don't feel that they're getting their money's worth. And so it's around this time that Alberta decides to establish its own police force and they move into Grand Prairie, as you mentioned, right around the same time as the murders. So prohibition starts uh, across Alberta um, a couple years before this case. That said, uh, in northern Alberta, prohibition really effectively had already been in play for a couple years. And at that time, you need a medicinal license to to have alcohol. Um, That said, when you are working on the farm for a long day, nothing cuts the hot prairie heat like a good drink. And so the population at large was not really on board with Prohibition. Um, You don't see the same degree of, let's call it criminality, uh, that you see in the larger centers, simply because um, there's not as much market for it. Um, But you do see some really creative solutions for getting around Prohibition. Um, We have lots of stories, for example, about Baldy Red, who is an infamous infamous bootlegger in this region and the the many antics that he got up to in circumnavigating the police. Um, You have lots of cases um, in in the archival record of people talking about the police's incompetence in dealing with bootlegging. Um, I think there's also a sense there at the time that they should be doing better things with their time. Uh, That's, I think, a narrative that continues regardless of what time period you're in, is people always feel that whatever is important to them is what should be important to the police. And and sometimes, often, dare I say, those things don't necessarily overlap. The police definitely have their hands full at this time. We do know that they were patrolling, for example, the main trails in and out of Grand Prairie in an effort to catch bootleggers in much the same way that this country now is hatched with dozens, dare I say, hundreds or thousands of roads and trails and backcountry routes. I mean, the case would have been even more so then. And, you know, it wasn't that there was a few thousand police officers. It was that there was a small handful and that they were covering a huge stretch of land. And I I believe, going back to the case, that the first two victims that were found, they actually had to call someone in from Peace River. Um, And so that, you know, that takes time, too. We have now a sense of modern convenience that when you call the police, they're there in moments, and that is just not the case. 
speaking of uh, bootlegging, a lot of people did it just for home consumption or with their neighbors so they'd have small stills. But a lot also did it so they could sell either to the native population or to other people in the area. Um, prior to 1916, when Prohibition came, the Athabasca district had been a dry district. You could not have taverns in the area. You could not legally sell liquor at all, but you could get permits if you needed it for medicinal purposes. And there were a lot of druggists, a lot of doctors who were willing to sell or will sign their names for a permit to get whiskey to sell your, to settle your, your medicinal problems. I think that these were people that were making a living outside of government regulation, let's call it that way. Whether or not they were doing all of these nefarious things, it's hard to say. I mean, a lot of these bootleggers at the time would have dealt directly with their customers. And so they wouldn't have been so far removed from the community as, as perhaps the police records might indicate because these people were still their neighbors. They were their customers and you couldn't sell your booze if you were alienating your customers. Inspector Commanding McDonald is blunt in his overall assessment of his own force. There has been an increase in the number of offenses dealt with, the increase following upon the increase of population. It is becoming more than ever apparent, however, that the strength of this division must be increased to keep pace with the changing conditions if crime and vice are to be effectively dealt with. The men available to police this district are insufficient and it is impossible to give prompt attention to all complaints. The results are detrimental to the interests of the public and ourselves. Among other solutions, McDonald calls for an increase in staff, including specifically in Grand Prairie, and an enlargement of the Grand Prairie Detachment Building. He also highlights some of the challenges of transportation for E-Division, specifically calling for a replacement of the Grand Prairie Detachment's lone car. McDonnell reports a number of crime statistics in his report, including 24 common assaults, two assaults causing grievous bodily harm, two shootings with intent, one incest case, 23 thefts, 17 vagrancy charges, 14 gambling charges, and 52 violations of the Liquor Act. There are eight murder victims discussed in the report, including the six men from our case. The state of policing in the region was so disappointing to local residents that the women of the area took matters into their own hands and circulated a petition, which they sent to the Attorney General of Alberta in Edmonton shortly after the murders. The petition of the women of the District of Grand Prairie humbly showeth that in view of the fact that serious criminal activity exists throughout northern Alberta and the Grand Prairie District in particular, including murder, there having been six murders within six miles of Grand Prairie during the past month and the criminals still at large. Wherefore, your petitioners pray that immediate steps be taken toward the proper and adequate policing of the Grand Prairie District and Northern Alberta. 228 women added their names to this statement, dated July 11, 1918, less than a month after the first bodies were discovered. They came from communities across the South Peace region, including Grand Prairie, Sexsmith, Lake Saskatoon, and even Pouscoupe, often anglicized as Puskupi, across the BC border to the west. We do know at the time that there is plenty of crime in Grand Prairie. Um, although this was horrific at the time and there's lots of speculation about what could have happened 
I think it's less than a year and a half later when a woman kills her husband and buries him in a root cellar. And at the time, the judge says that that is the most horrific crime that has ever happened in Grand Prairie. So it's just interesting that for a variety of reasons, there's a lot of things going on at Grand Prairie at the time. It wasn't uncommon for there to be murders or murder-suicides. Typically, the police were more invested in finding a solution when the victims contributed to the government values of the time. That's a polite way of saying generally Western European settlers versus other immigrants or indigenous peoples. Again, though, it's it's very easy for us to cast judgment on the past and on the records of the past through our modern lens. We often refer to what the records say on a particular subject, um, and that's where you can have a, a distinction between um, history and historical fact. And Often those lines get really muddied, especially 100 years later, especially when it's an event that is so talked about uh, 100 years later. Because I find that people in Grand Prairie tend to fall into one of two camps. Either they know about the story, they grew up hearing about the story, their grandfather had a theory of who did it and you know all of these things, or they've never heard of it. I've spoken with people that have lived in Grand Prairie their entire lives. And when you say, well, you know, the 1918 murders, Alberta's largest unsolved mass murder, they go, what? I had no idea. <laughs> Grand Prairie had a lot of things going on in 1918 and in, in broadly the early 20th century. And so I think that this narrative gets overshadowed by things like the First World War, which had very substantial lasting impacts on our region. The Spanish flu, which had a lot of impacts on our medical history and our medical um, community here. So I think that even though in hindsight, it's really significant as what we now know to be Alberta's largest unsolved mass murder. Uh, at the time, it was just one piece of many contributing to a very difficult life for the people that found themselves e here either by, by design, they've immigrated here, or the people that were here before popular immigration. When we hear from settlers, for example, who, when asked about the murders 50 years later, say things like, oh, I don't remember their names, there was a few of them, nothing ever came of it. It didn't have a substantial impact on their lives relative to all the other things that they were struggling with. And so as a result, it kind of falls by the wayside against those other stories that had more profound impact on them personally. All history is relative. There is no one historical truth. And it's up to your listeners to ultimately determine what they think is the truth. Inspector Commanding McDonald did provide a summary of what we are calling the six murder case in his 1918 police report. In that summary, he details some of the key facts and evidence available at the time of his writing in December of 1918. He notes that Detective Sergeant, Sergeant Irvine, Irvine is at present working on it. Every effort is being put forward, regardless of expense, to secure evidence as to who committed these murders. Undoubtedly, all these men were murdered for robbery. I hope that in time the case will reach a satisfactory conclusion. As we all know, with the benefit of hindsight 103 years later, that satisfactory conclusion was not to be found, and the six murder case has never been solved. We hope you enjoyed this special episode of Blood on the Prairie. We'd like to extend our full gratitude to our historian guests in this episode, 
Dr. David Leonard, and Alyssa Curry. David and Alyssa spent quite a bit of time with us in our studio to talk about the murders as well as what life was like on the prairies in the early 20th century. We asked our guests to tell us about their own backgrounds, and here is what they had to say. First is Dr. David Leonard, whose interesting and varied experience from many parts of Canada led him to become the resident expert on Northern Alberta history. David was also kind enough to share with us some of his own research material about the case. I'm a uh, a resident of Sexsmith, Alberta, which I was, grew up in Sexsmith, Uh, went to the University of Alberta where I studied history, did my master's in history at the U of A, Uh, worked two years as the provincial archivist before going to Sheffield, England to study Irish history uh, to get a PhD, which occurred in the summer of 1975. Uh, returned to Canada, broken out of a job, did various things, but got on as the city of Edmonton assistant archivist in 76. Fall of 78, I was appointed as the first archivist of the Northwest Territories, located in Yellowknife, where I stayed till 1981. Uh, left there to join the Provincial Archives of Alberta again, as head of the government records program. Uh, stayed with the Provincial Archives till 1996, and the last as head of the of the government records program. Last three years, I served as the provincial archivist of Alberta, then joined historic sites as the historian for Northern Alberta, specializing primarily in the Peace River country, where I have written several books and involved in writing some more. Alyssa Curry met with us when she was the executive director of the South Peace Regional Archives, but she's since moved on from that position. Alyssa has a long-standing family history in the region, and we particularly enjoyed her enthusiasm and investment in our local history. So I have an undergraduate degree in English and History from the University of Northern British Columbia. Uh, It was during my history degree that I actually had my first experience working with archives as a historian. I handled some Hudson's Bay Company records looking at various animal populations uh, in the 19th century in Canada. And when I went on to do my master's degree, my master's degree is in English, um, but my research topic was an interdisciplinary one in which I made use of archival records. So my research project was about uh, tigers in 1870s London um, and how they fit in with uh, the English literary tradition of William Blake. Um, But my project was very much an interdisciplinary one. I had the privilege of getting to travel to London and work with various archival institutions in London, as well as in Canada. And it was through that that really my interests started to spark. And then I was very lucky to get to work at Library and Archives Canada for four months during my graduate studies. I worked in the Literature, Music and Performing Arts Archive, and I got an opportunity to there to work with our nation's heritage and what that means both on a grand scheme of things, but also right down to the scale of an individual letter or document. We could not have produced this episode, or the podcast as a whole, without their valuable contributions. Thank you, David, and thank you, Alyssa. Blood on the Prairie is produced by Chris Cipolla and Chris Beauchamp. We'd like to thank the South Peace Regional Archives, the Provincial Archives of Alberta, Alyssa Curry, Karen Simonson, Dr. David Leonard, Brenda LaCroix, the family of Wallace Tansom, Jason Halwa, Al Peterson, Casper Towns, Gordy Hackstead, Richard Pizzata, and Laura Beauchamp. Blood on the Prairie was developed thanks to funding provided by TELUS StoryHive. Special thanks to Tara Jean Stevens, Jessica Gibson, and the National Screen Institute. Music used in this episode by Yehezkel Raz, James Paul Mitchell, Ziv Grinberg, the United States Navy Band, Matt Stewart-Evans, Kyle Preston, Brianna Tam, Oakfield, and Lance Conrad. Our voice actors in this episode included Richard Pizzata and Laura Beauchamp. Blood on the Prairie is available on all major podcast platforms. 
For show notes and access to archival sources and other documents relating to the case, as well as photographs from both the 1918 era and the crime scenes in 2021, find us at bloodontheprairie.com. You can find and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for photos, audio clips, historical snippets, original source documents, and bonus content from the case.